morning, everyone, and welcome to our Sunday worship today here in Emmanuel Christian Reformed Church. And let's prepare ourselves to be in a posture of worship as we encounter our Lord this morning. In our singing, in our praying, our listening and responding to scripture together. Let us start by declaring glory to God in our call to worship. God of Jonah, God of mercy, God of second chances of resurrection. Glory, glory be to you. God of light, God of love. Glory be to you. God of wisdom and of compassion. Glory be to you. May we learn to love you from Christ Jesus. Hallelujah. God is our father of second chances, who always has his outstretched arm towards us, inviting us to be restored unto him. Colossians 1, 19 to 21 reads, For him all the fullness of God was pleased to dwell, and through him to reconcile to himself all things, whether on earth or in heaven, making peace by the blood of his cross. And you who once were alienated and hostile in mind, doing evil deeds. As we pass the peace of Christ to one another, within the sanctuary and to our brothers and sisters joining us in our live stream via messaging, we identify with Jesus, who extended his life to the point of death to make peace with humanity. Let us now pass the peace of Christ. Peace of Christ. Peace of Christ. Peace of Christ. And as we continue to pass the peace of Christ through messaging, if I'll be reading from Ephesians 4, 18 to 21. For through him, we both have access in one spirit to the Father. So then you are no longer strangers and aliens, but you are fellow citizens with the saints and members of the household of God. Let us all stand to sing songs of praise as one household, as one holy temple to the King of Kings. Good morning. Um, I as I was praying this morning about for our worship service today, the um, the word that comes to mind is privilege. And uh, let me just briefly read to you from Isaiah, wherein Isaiah says, "Holy, holy, holy is the Lord Almighty. The whole earth is full of His glory." The sound of their voices, the doorpost and threshold shook, and the temple was filled with smoke. And that image brings to me an image of maybe trembling and fear. Uh, that's what Isaiah felt. Yet in Hebrews, we are encouraged to come before the throne of God with grace and confidence. So as we come to worship before the Lord, it is truly a privilege to remember that this is an almighty, holy God, yet we can come before him with our concerns, with our daily issues. And so let's sing before him boldly, but with reverence, knowing what we are in the throne of a most holy God. In the darkness we were waiting Without hope, without light Till from heaven you came running There was mercy in your eyes To fulfill the law and prophets To a virgin king the word From a throne of endless glory To a cradle in the dirt for 
forever to the King of Kings. To reveal the kingdom coming and to reconcile the lost, to redeem the whole creation, you did not despise the cross. For even in your suffering, you saw to the other side. Knowing this was our salvation, Jesus, for our sake you died. Let's praise him. Praise the Father. The Lamb has conquered death, and the dead rose from their tombs, and the angels stood in awe for the souls of all who come to the Father are restored. And the church of Christ was born, and the Spirit lit the flame. Now this gospel truth of old shall not kneel, shall not fade. By his blood and in his name, in his freedom I am free. For the love of Jesus Christ, who has resurrected me. Lamb, the 
lamb that was slain for the sins of the world his blood breaks the chains and every knee will bow before the lion and the lamb every knee will bow before him who can stop the lord almighty yes indeed who can, who stop, can the stop the lord almighty stop the Lord Almighty? Who can stop the Lord? Our God is the Lion, the Lion of Judah. He's roaring with power and fighting our battles. And every knee will bow before Him. Our God is the Lamb, the Lamb that was slain. For the sins of the world, his blood breaks the chains, and every knee will bow before the lion and the lamb. Every knee will bow before him. Indeed, amen. We give you praise, our lion and our lamb. Let's all be seated in God's presence. Our God is a lamb who gave himself, died, and rose again in order to break our chains and free us from spiritual poverty and restore us into a personal and loving relationship with him. How does our faith in Christ affect our concern for the poor? Jesus, Jesus showed, showed concern, concern for our spiritual poverty. poverty. And, and he, he who was rich emptied himself and became poor for our sake. sake. Therefore, Therefore, having put our faith in him, we are moved to give ourselves in service and in kind to those who are also poor, whether spiritually or materially so. God's purpose of salvation through Jesus Christ isn't just to save us from hell, and get us into heaven, but rather to shape us into the image of Jesus. But we have to participate in this process of sanctification with him, and part of that is confessing our sins and asking for his forgiveness for the power of the Holy Spirit to enable us to walk out of the enemy's hold on us. Woe to us, have mercy on us, Lord, for we have been like Pharisees, believing our worth is in our actions and obedience. But truly, our worth is in you, O Lord. In your love and grace, forgive us for not being grounded in you. Our sins are ever for us, but your love is greater, your mercy more powerful, and so we trust you. Forgive us, Lord, and have mercy on this world for it is in need of healing, of growing, of re reconciling. Jesus, our King, have mercy in this season and all seasons, and may the world see your resurrection. Take a few moments in silent prayer to confess our sins and ask for the Lord's forgiveness. Let us now pray the Lord's Prayer as one body. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Our words of grace from Galatians 2, verses 16 and 21. We know that a person is not justified by works of the law, but through faith in Jesus Christ. 
as we also have believed in Christ Jesus, in order to be justified by faith in Christ and not by works of the law. Because by works of the law, no one will be justified. We do, we do not, not nullify the, the grace of God, for, for if righteousness were through the law, then, then Christ died for no purpose. purpose. Let us now all stand as we sing our song of renewal. strength when I am weak. You are the treasure that I seek. You are my all in all. Seeking you as a precious jewel. Lord, to give up by be a fool. You are my all Jesus is our all in all, and worthy is he indeed. We respond for what he has done for us by glorifying his name through our adoration, by trusting in his grace and forgiveness, and by our worship through giving. You may visit our icrc.ca giving um, link to see the ways that you can give an offering. And for checks, uh, please address the check with a full name, as we've always mentioned, for Emmanuel Christian Reformed Church. Let's now come to a time of prayer of thanksgiving, and let's bow down our heads as we pray to our Father. Thank you, Lord, for the grace you give us every day. We understand that we don't deserve what we receive from you. We understand that without you, we can do nothing. Let your grace abound through us to love not only you, Lord, but all your people we meet in our lives. Lord, you are the source of such grace. So continue to mold and teach us to live according to your will. 
This we pray in the name of Jesus. Amen. And at this time, the children may now make their way up. Uh, just go through the back and work your way up the stairs. And reminder again for the parents, um, you will be picking up your kids on exit this way, and there will be a sign outside where you can pick up the kids after Sunday school. Just a couple more, a uh, few announcements that, uh, to highlight this morning. Uh, we do have baptism registration ongoing, and baptism day is for December 12th. Um, classes will be through Zoom for six sessions between October 18th and November 27th. And if you are interested, uh, please reach out to Pastor Marcus and myself, and we will get you set up. Uh, salt gatherings uh, continue to gather on Fridays at 7.30 p.m. on the evenings, socially distanced with masks, and you may email Pastor Marcus if you have any questions with regards to uh, that meeting. Um, and youth Bible class also continues to meet every Sunday morning at 10.15 a.m. And the English morning prayer meeting continues to meet via Zoom every Sunday at 10.30 a.m. And also, tied to the message this morning, uh, Pastor Yo has given us a Spotify playlist to check out afterwards. Uh, this link is on the order of worship printed copies and the copies online. Uh, and it is also available, you may have seen it already through the ICRC weekly announcements email if you're subscribed to it. So the link would be there as well. And we now go to our passage this morning, which I'll be reading for you from, from Luke 11, 29 to 54. And please go through it with me as I read from the ESV. Luke chapter 11, verse 29. When the crowds were increasing, he began to say, this generation is an evil generation. It seeks for a sign but no sign will be given to it, except the sign of Jonah. For as Jonah became a sign to the people of Nineveh, so will the Son of Man be to this generation. The Queen of the South will rise up at the judgment with the men of this generation and condemn them, for she came from the ends of the earth to hear the wisdom of Solomon, and behold, something greater than Solomon is here. The men of Nineveh will rise up at the judgment with this generation and condemn it. For they repented at the preaching of Jonah. And behold, something greater than Jonah is here. No one after a lamp puts it in a cellar and under a basket, but on a stand so that those who may enter may see the light. Your eye is the lamp, of your body, and when your eye is healthy, your whole body is full of light. But when it is bad, your body is full of darkness. Therefore, be careful, lest the light in you be darkness. If then your whole body is full of light, having no part dark, it will be wholly bright, as when a lamp with its rays gives you light. Woes to the Pharisees and lawyers. While Jesus was speaking, a Pharisee asked him to dine with him, so he went in and reclined at the table. The Pharisee was astonished to see that he did not first wash before dinner. And the Lord said to him, Now you Pharisees cleanse the outside of the cup and of the dish, but inside you are full of greed and wickedness. You fools! Did not he who made the outside make the inside also? But give us alms those things that are within, and behold, everything is clean for you. But woe to the Pharisees, for you tithe mint and rue and every herb and neglect justice and the love of God. These you ought to have done without neglecting the others. Woe to you, Pharisees, for you love the best seat in the synagogues and greetings in the marketplaces. 
Woe to you, for you are like unmarked graves, and people walk over them without knowing it. One of the lawyers answered him, Teacher, in saying these things, you insult us also. And he said, Woe to you lawyers also, for you load people with burdens hard to bear, and you yourselves do not touch the burdens with one of your fingers. Woe to you, for you build the tombs of the prophets whom your fathers killed. So you are witnesses, and you consent to the deeds of your fathers, for they killed them, and then you build their tombs. Therefore also the wisdom of God said, I will send them prophets and apostles, some of whom they will kill and persecute, so that the blood of all the prophets shed from the foundation of the world may be charged against this generation. From the blood of Abel to the blood of Zechariah, who perished between the altar and the sanctuary, yes, I tell you, it will be required of this generation. Woe to you lawyers, for you have taken away the key of knowledge. You did not enter yourselves, and you hindered those who were entering. As he went away from there, the scribes and the Pharisees began to press him hard and to provoke him to speak about many things, lying in wait for him to catch him in something he might say. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Let us now welcome Pastor Yo from Nelson Avenue Burnaby CRC to bring us God's message this morning. Father, we've already prayed about different things this morning, but we do pray now that you'd help us as we heard this reading, a longer reading, maybe than sometimes we're used to, so help us to have heard that for ourselves. And then, Lord, now as I start talking, Lord, on my mouth, my tongue, but also my heart and my mind, but Lord, for all of us, help us to discern the word you're saying to us this morning. Help us to hear it and receive it. And Lord, stir it into us by your Spirit. Help us to be a, a fresh word from you this morning. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. So good to be here with you this morning. Uh, Emmanuel CRC English Congregation, for those of you here in person and for those of you online, uh, whether this morning or in coming days or weeks or months, whenever you watch this online, uh, good for me to be here with you this morning. And uh, I want to thank Hector for the invitation uh, to come and bring the word. And I uh, also want to thank the worship team for leading us. Uh, I love that opening song, uh, King of Kings. We haven't done that yet at Nelson Avenue, but I just think it's an amazing song. So thank you for leading us. And for the liturgy, uh, very rich liturgy that you have here at Emmanuel. So uh, for those who put that together and lead us this morning, uh, really, really thankful. Um, I realize that your sermon series on the Gospel of Luke continues because uh, I gave a couple of messages pre-recorded in February from the fifth chapter, and now a few months later you're in chapter 11, and I don't know how the series is going for you, uh, but this is a great way for a church community to, to, to know a book of the Bible well. So if you're here on a regular basis, either in person or watching, it's a great way to know the gospel writer, Luke, and to know the book. Uh, and I'm not, I'm not sure if you're uh, catching some of his themes. I assume you are. But he focuses a lot of attention on the poor, on the parables of Jesus, on the kingdom, focus on Jesus' relationship with women, how he included them uh, in his uh, discipleship group. Uh, he wants to tell the story accurately but also, of course, is focus on Jesus. And this morning, uh, it was a long passage that we read, I think longer than usual. Uh, so that was the reading I was assigned this morning, but I can't look at all of that. It's, uh, for me, way too big. So we're just going to focus on a few things Jesus says from the beginning of the passage. So we've read a bunch of verses, what I might call the context, but now we want to spend a few moments just looking at a small text. And it might feel like I'm just kind of grabbing 
some random things that Jesus said, uh, but my hope is this morning that it's a way for us to actually hear the whole story of the Bible. And this for me is really helpful sometimes. Like I want to know the details and the specifics, but I also want to know the whole story. So we're going to try and do that this morning. And if you have your Bibles open, if you have a Bible, you're welcome to turn back to or just have it open uh, to Luke 11. Uh, but we, ha- we can do this on a kind of regular basis. There are verses in the Bible, like John 3.16, For God so loved the world, He gave His one and only Son. You can read that verse, and you can get the whole story of the Bible in that one verse. And then there are some times where we can take an image or a theme, like the theme of the city, or the theme of the temple, or the theme of the image of God, and we can take a theme and we can run it right through the Bible and get a sense of what the whole Bible is all about. Um, And if you ever watch the Bible Project videos, uh, they do a great job of that. They, they, They will take a theme like the Son of Man or Messiah, and they will run from the beginning to the end of the Bible in about five minutes, and you, if you watch enough of those videos, you, you get a good sense of what the Bible is about. Now, this morning, I don't know if you're used to this, and I don't know how this will go over, uh, but I'd like to stop, at least for a few moments, three times in the message and ask you a question. Now, you may or may not respond. I don't know how it's going to go this morning. Uh, I know at Nelson Avenue, I try and prepare people, and then it sometimes goes well, and sometimes there's no, and that's okay. If there's no response, it's okay, because I kind of know what I'm going to say anyhow. Uh, but there's going to be three moments in the message. One's coming pretty soon, then one kind of middle of the message, and one toward the end. I'm going to be asking you for just a few people to respond. So this morning, it's from the beginning of the passage... And this is kind of the question for us this morning as we're looking at the first part of the passage from Luke uh, 11, starting in verse 29. I want to ask you, and in a few moments, ask you to respond, who's the goat? Who is the greatest? I I don't know if you know that question. G-O-A-T. Who's the greatest of all time? And I I can take a response from any area you're thinking about. Uh, Who is the greatest person you've ever met? Who's the greatest politician, the greatest leader, the greatest athlete, the greatest celebrity, the greatest fashion designer, the greatest car maker? Whatever it is, who for you is the GOAT? Now, I know you have your masks on, so it can be maybe a little tough to say something, uh, but anybody some area of their lives are thinking about where they say, this person for me is the greatest of all time. <laughs> Victor, thank you. Roger Federer. Roger Federer, tennis player. Now, of course, there will be some discussion. Any, any, any other tennis players here? Just, just Victor. <laughs> oh, okay, so you know, could be Roger, it could be, yeah, it could be Nadal, or, you know, we could go back, McEnroe, Jimmy Connors, if you're old, old enough to remember those names, so, but here, here here's a, a voice for us, who's the greatest tennis player of all time, anybody else, who's the GOAT in some area you're thinking about? Tom Brady, Tom Brady. okay, so another athlete, football player, quarterback, I'm sure a lot of people would say Tom Brady is the greatest. Maybe not everybody, but I think a lot would would say. Anybody else? Now, this is actually a question, believe it or not, and maybe some of you already recognize that because we're in a a church this morning, pastors talking. So this is a way for us to also think about the Bible. This This is, I think, how the Bible is put together. It's presenting, it's asking that question all the time. Who is the GOAT? Who is the greatest of all time? And I don't know if I had to tell you the answer, but I will. I assume most of us will know the answer, or at least we know what I'm looking for. But this morning, I won't look at the answer, but I also want to impress upon you 
that this is a really important way and a really crucial way for us to read the Bible. That it's not just random stories that we're hearing or random proverbs, but every time you read anything in the Bible, and I want to push you on that, anything you read in the Bible, lurking behind that passage is who's the goat? Who's the greatest of all time? And the Bible is interested in that question because it's a way to understand the Bible story. It's also because everybody in human history wants to know the answer. Who's the greatest emperor? Who's the greatest king? Who's the greatest general? Who's the greatest athletes? Because if you can answer that question for your life, let's say, not just sports, but for your life, if you knew if you know who's the greatest for your life, then you will follow the goat, right? The goat will get your attention. The goat will get your affections. The goat will get your heart and your will and your commitment. And that's what the Bible's after. The Bible's not just about information or knowledge or interesting specifics, but it wants to engage us at the deepest level of who we are. And of course, the Bible's answer to the goat is the Messiah. Jesus the Christ or Jesus the Messiah, he is the goat. He is greater. He is greatest. Now, when, when I say that, now here is pretty safe, right, to say that. But when I say Jesus is the greatest, am I saying he's greater than Elon Musk or Jeff Bezos in terms of organizing companies? or business savvy, or making money? Is that what I'm saying? That is Jesus greater than Elon and Jeff? Or am I saying, is he greater than Messi and LeBron at football or basketball or Roger at tennis or Tom Brady at football? Is, is he faster and can jump higher? Is he going to win the championships? Or when I say Jesus is greater, am I saying he's the greatest artist? Greater than Van Gogh or Rembrandt or any other great artist that you might be thinking about? And I'm thinking about Van Gogh because tonight my wife and I get to go to Van Gogh, that interactive um, event, the Vancouver Convention Center. So I'm thinking about that, looking forward to that. So when I say, or when the Bible says Jesus is the goat, are, is the Bible saying He's greater than Van Gogh, greater than Messi, greater than Jeff or Elon. And I feel pressure this morning to say yes. You know, I feel pressure to say he is the greatest business person or athlete or artist or designer. Anything anybody could do, Jesus could do better. But I don't have to say that, I don't think, for my Christian commitment to still be intact. For, for, for me to sing about the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords, he's my all in all, I don't have to say he would be the fastest or the strongest because the Bible is not talking about the goat in those categories, right? It's not presenting Jesus as the greatest athlete, the best looking, the, the greatest money maker, the best wardrobe, the best business sense. It's, it's asking different kinds of questions which for some of us might be disappointing. I'm, I'm not sure about for you, but the Bible's asking who brings that message that delivers people from bondage? Or whose message includes the whole world? Or whose message will set you free and get right into your heart? Who's the one, not just now for a few moments or a few days or a few years, but who is the one both now and forever that can give you fullest life, truest life, that can set you free, that can redeem you from slavery, save you, forgive you. And the categories of the Bible are not so much athlete or business person or artist, but who's the greatest king, the greatest prophet, the greatest priest, who can deliver humanity from its greatest problem, that is sin against God and against each other. In that way, Jesus is the greatest. And all of this discussion of the goat is coming from the early verses of the passage we read this morning, 
where Jesus is actually warning the people in a very um, striking way that Jesus begins. Uh, he says right at the beginning, <laughs> and, and, and sometimes when I, when I read the, when I, I, more and more when I read the Bible, especially what Jesus says, I'm, like, I'm just shocked. Like, how could people listen to this? He says the first thing this morning we heard is, this is a wicked generation. Now, why is it a wicked generation? I'm going to suggest he's saying that because he's, he's, he's telling them, you're not making a good judgment. People in the past knew who the goat was of their day, but you can't see the goat of your day. So he, he says to them, the Queen of Sheba, I don't know if you know that story from the Old Testament, the Queen of Sheba came to visit King Solomon, and she found the goat. Right? In 1 Kings chapter 10, after she saw Solomon and the kingdom and all his wealth, she says in 1 Kings chapter 10, the report I heard in my country about your achievements and your wisdom is true. But I did not believe these things until I came and saw them with my own eyes. Indeed, not even half was told me. In wisdom and wealth, you have far exceeded the report I heard. So I heard a report, couldn't believe it. I saw you, I saw the kingdom, I saw your wealth, and the report was half true. You are, King Solomon, you are the goat. You are greater than the report I heard. Or Jesus says, don't, or, or make sure that the people of Nineveh don't judge you because the people of Nineveh made a good judgment about Jonah. Now, Jonah was an incredibly successful prophet, actually. I'm not sure if we always think about him that way. But he had a very short message, only eight words in English. Forty more days and Nineveh will be overthrown. That's all we know of what he said. He's walking through the city of Nineveh, it seems like, saying that. Like a, a very condemning message. Not even repent or turn to God. All he says is the fact, in 40 more days, this city will be overthrown. I think he's grumbling as he's saying this sermon. The next verse says, the Ninevites believed God. A fast was proclaimed, and all of them, from the greatest to the least, put on sackcloth. So here we have grumbling Jonah with the shortest message of, 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 of human history, and the whole city responds with repentance and revival. And Jesus is saying, those people, they knew the message was true. They knew this prophet was, he had a great message, and they responded to the greatness of the message. And these people, Jesus kind of, kind of rubs it in on them, they were Gentiles. The Queen of Sheba was a Gentile. The people of Nineveh were Gentiles. They did not have all the history that you have, yet they made a proper judgment. You too should make a proper judgment. And he says this, and this is what I want to focus on this morning, because he says, someone or something greater than Solomon is here. So the Queen of Sheba saw Solomon. Whoa, you're the goat. Now something greater than Solomon is here, and Jesus is really imploring the people, recognize the greatness in front of you. Don't, don't let the greatness pass by. You don't notice the greatness of Solomon. So we need to ask, is Jesus greater than Solomon? And in what way is he greater? So he's not greater in terms of he has more gold or more wealth or more wives or a bigger palace or a bigger army. That's not what the Bible is after. How is Jesus greater than Solomon? I'm going to suggest a couple of ways. Jesus is not flawed like Solomon. So Solomon, his many wives led him astray from God, which was not the fault of the wives, right? That was Solomon's fault. I also want to suggest this morning that having that many wives, like hundreds of wives, 
was actually abusing those women, which Jesus did not do. He did not abuse women. So he, he, Jesus is not a let, he's not led astray by others. He's not abusing others. He's not flawed like King Solomon. He's also getting at deeper wisdom than Solomon. Solomon could see something and make it accurate. Um, he, he, he could see it right. And there are stories about that. But Jesus always goes deeper than Solomon, and he does that also in our passage, passage, passage this morning. In verse 39, he says, Now then, you Pharisees, you clean the outside of the cup and dish, but inside you are full of greed and wickedness. You foolish people, did not the one who made the outside make the inside also? But now as for what is inside you, be generous to the poor and everything will be clean for you. Jesus is never concerned, as most religious leaders are, and even, to be, to be honest, most pastors are, just clean up your life. I, I just want to see better behavior from you. I want to see you do the right things. You know, be a nice person, be good. Everything's always exterior. And Jesus, I would say, well, he's, he's, he's concerned about the exterior, but more importantly, about the interior which is really a difference between, let's say, Solomon and all religious leaders, most people, it's all about moral reformation. So, you, you know, if someone's not behaving at school, let's just make sure they sit down, they're quiet, they say yes and please and all that. Just all the exterior. But Jesus, Jesus is always after spiritual transformation. Something is wrong on the inside, as he says in Matthew chapter 15. It's, it's what comes out of the heart that makes a person unclean. So the character of Jesus is greater, and the moral or wisdom teaching of Jesus is greater than King Solomon. Jesus also says something or someone greater than Jonah is here. Now here's question number two for us. How is Jesus greater than Jonah? Now, I'm not sure if you all know the story of Jonah. If you don't, I recommend it to you. It's a very interesting story. How is Jesus greater than the prophet Jonah? Jonah on the boat, Jonah thrown into the water, Jonah in the belly of the fish, Jonah spit out. Jonah going through Nineveh, and then that final chapter, Jonah under that, that tree or that bush. I'm going to suggest Jonah, I'm, I'm going to say he was wildly successful. Like, I wish I had a ministry like Jonah. You say eight words on a Sunday morning, the whole place, sackcloth and ashes. And that's amazing. But, as I was trying to say before, how, what, what's, what's going on inside Jonah as he's preaching? I don't want these people to repent. I know what's going to happen. They're going to they're gonna turn. If they turn, if they repent, God's going to be merciful. I don't want God to be merciful. That's why he's running away to Tarshish. That's why he's waiting under the tree. He wants the fire to fall on the city. In that way, he's a successful but flawed person prophets. Jesus comes and he wants people to be saved. He wants them to experience life. He wants them to be healed. Jesus is never hogging, You're holding back from people. He wants all the goodness of God to flow into whoever is going to receive it. And his message is not just for a city or a people, but it's, it's for the nations. For anyone who would hear the message of Christ, Jesus wanting the message to go out and be received. So this is how I, you know, and I'm, I'm learning as well, but he mentions, Jesus mentions greater than Solomon, greater than Jonah. These people from the Old Testament stories, as we, as we hear their stories or we read about them, it's always... As we get to Jesus, oh, he's actually greater than this great prophet, great king, great queen, great leader. He's always greater. But not just people, but also institutions. Like Jesus says, and this is maybe the, 
the most audacious thing Jesus ever said. In Matthew chapter 12, he says, I tell you that something greater than the temple is here. Now I think maybe people would have said, well, Solomon, yeah, he was flawed. You could be greater than him, maybe. Or Jonah, he was flawed. Okay, maybe you're better than Jonah. But how dare you say you're greater than the temple? Because for the Jewish people, I don't think we can ever quite understand what the temple meant to them. And for some Jewish people, even today, what it still means to them. Oh, that there would be another temple for some Jewish people. The temple was the presence of God among them. True worship, central worship, the sacrifices, the priesthood, everything was in Jerusalem, the city, at the temple, the building. So if Jesus says something greater than the temple is here, the only way he can say that is... If he's greater than the temple, like God is greater than the temple. That's the only reality, the only thing, the only person greater than the temple. And not just the temple, but there are other times where someone's talking and we realize, oh, it's also the sacrifices in the temple Jesus is greater than. Like John the Baptist in John chapter 1, he doesn't use the language of greater than, but he says, behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of Israel. No. Who takes away the sin of the Israelites and the Moabites. No. Who takes away the sin of half the world. No. Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the whole world. And as we hear that, we realize, whoa, this is one, one person who, who, who symbolizes, the, the, the lamb symbolizes this, Jesus. One lamb, one sacrifice that really forgives. Because the sacrifices in the Old Testament didn't actually forgive. It was always pointing ahead. And there were hundreds and thousands of sacrifices. And John the Baptist is saying, here's one person who will be sacrificed once for the sins of the whole world. And the list goes on. And, and we don't have time this morning. I'm just going to list a few other people. But things for us to be aware of, Jesus greater than Solomon, Jonah, the temple, the, 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 the Old Testament lambs or sacrifices, greater than Adam, greater than the angels, greater than Esther, greater than Moses and Jacob and Joshua and Ruth. And the list goes on and on. This is how the Bible is moving. And the Bible is really suggesting to us, if Jesus is not the goat, then don't follow him. Follow the one who is the goat. And if Jesus is not the goat, then the Bible should be about someone else, the one who's really the greatest. But if we find in Jesus, he, he is the goat. He, he really is the greatest of all time then something shifts in our relationship with Jesus. And this is one way also for me to kind of figure out, am I really following Jesus for Jesus' sake? Or am I following Jesus for my sake? Kind of for selfish reasons, because sometimes I find that I'm following Jesus, but I want Jesus for what he gives me. I want some healing. I want some help. I want some heaven. But I don't really want Jesus. I want him as a means to, to get what I want. But when I start thinking of him, is he really the greatest? Is he really the goat also for my life? Then it becomes not so much, oh, I'm following him, but really I want something else. But I'm following him, and I'm following him because he is the greatest. He is greater. He is the true and better. He really is glorious. He really is beautiful. And I'm following him because I want Christ. I want him. And this morning I want to encourage you, there's, I think there's at least there's a number of things, but three things for you as a community to consider. Um, 
thinking about Jesus as the goat, I want to encourage you to be discovering that for yourselves. Now, not just individually, but also as a community. And going through the Gospel of Luke is a great way to discover that. Uh, here's, my, here's my third question for us. Has anyone discovered that yet in the Gospel of Luke thus far? You, you think about maybe some of the sermons you've heard, the stories you've been thinking about, the passages. Is there a place you'd say, oh, Luke, he was, he was showing this to me already in the previous 10 chapters. Anybody got a, a place where you'd say, oh, Luke is showing me Jesus as the greatest. I'm thinking about the previous chapter, chapter 10, the, the parable of the Good Samaritan. Now that parable never stops talking. If you read that well, do you hear that for your life? There is no teacher that teaches like Jesus. And it's never about, oh, make sure you're a good person. Do all the good things. It's always getting inside. Always getting inside of us. Read the parable of the, of the Good Samaritan or the parable of the prodigal son and read it with a, with a, with a view of what's in it for me inside, not, not, not just external, but how is he trying to get inside of me? I want to encourage you, and we've already mentioned this, that there are songs we can be listening to, not just on Sunday morning, but during the week. So there's, there's this playlist on Spotify uh, in your bulletins. I encourage you to have songs like this that point to Jesus greater, which, which doesn't mean you, you can't listen to your Drake or Kanye or Bieber or Abba. You can still listen to those but also some songs during the week that are pointing to the greatness of Jesus. It's not just Sunday morning. Not just Sunday morning, but also during the week we're connecting with the greatness of Jesus. And then thirdly, sometimes we need to actually, okay, I, I think and maybe I believe this. The, the pastor's talking about that this morning. Maybe I believe this, maybe I don't, but sometimes the Christian faith demands I'm going to step out as if I believe it. I'm going, to, I'm going to make a decision. And one thing I want to encourage you, whether you're younger or a little bit older, is to believe that Jesus is greater. And this week, for the next you know, seven days, try and believe that Jesus is the greatest friend you'll ever have. Which doesn't mean you can't have other friends, right? But to believe that in Jesus, this is a friend that will be unlike any other friend. Uh, he will never reject, never cold shoulder, never walk away, never pull a punch, never gossip, never abandon. And to live the next seven days until you meet again here, I'm, I'm going to try and develop a friendship with Jesus this week and then in the future, but believing this week, he, he is, there's, there's talk about friendship in the Bible and experience friendship in my own life, but he is the greater friend. He is a true and better friend. So what we're going to do now is we're going to watch a short video that talks about Jesus as the true and better, the greater. And then after that, I think it's a song that comes from the playlist. So after the video, we'll sing together one song that talks about the greatness of Jesus. Is the true and better Adam who passed the test in the garden, his garden, a much tougher garden, and whose obedience is imputed to us. Jesus is the true and better Abel, who, though innocently slain, has blood that cries out, not for our condemnation, but for our acquittal. Jesus is the true and better Abraham, who answered the call of God to leave all the comfortable and familiar and go into the void, not knowing whither he went. Jesus is the true and better Isaac, who was not just offered up by his father on the mount, but was truly sacrificed for us all, while God said to Abraham, now I know you love me because you did not withhold your son, your only son, whom you love from me. Now we at the foot of the cross can say to God, now we know that you love me, because you did not withhold your son, your only son, whom you love from me. Jesus is the true and better Jacob, who wrestled and took the blow of justice we deserve, so we, like Jacob, only receive the wounds of grace that wake us up and discipline us. Jesus is the true and better Joseph, who is at the right hand of the king and forgives those who betrayed and sold him and uses his power to save them. 
Jesus is the true and better Moses who stands in the gap between the people and the Lord and who mediates a new covenant. Jesus is the true and better rock of Moses who struck with the rod of God's justice now gives us water in the desert. Jesus is the true and better Job. He's the truly innocent sufferer who then intercedes for and saves his stupid friends. <laughs> is that a type? See, that's not typology, it's an instinct. Jesus is the true and better David, whose victory becomes his people's victory, though they never lifted a stone to accomplish it themselves. Jesus is the true and better Esther, who didn't just risk losing an earthly palace, but lost the ultimate heavenly one, who didn't just risk his life, but gave his life. Who didn't just say, if I perish, I perish, says, when I perish, I'll perish for them to save my people. Jesus is the true and better Jonah, who was cast out into the storm so that we could be brought in. He's, he's the real Passover lamb. He's, he's the true temple, the true prophet, the true priest, the true king, the true sacrifice, the true lamb, the true light, the true bread. The Bible's not about you. and declare that with Jesus' one sacrifice, with his blood, that is the reason why we are all here today. What can wash away my sin? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. What but the blood of Jesus. Oh, precious is the flow that makes me white as snow. No other fount I know. Nothing but the blood of Jesus. For my pardon, this I see. Nothing but the blood of Jesus. Not of good, not of good that I have done. Nothing but the blood of Jesus. Oh, precious is the flow that makes me white as snow. No other fount I know. Nothing but the blood of Jesus. Amen. You want to put your hands out, but also into your hearts. Receive this blessing of God and then go out with the blessing. As you talk to each other, family and friends, the blessing of God with you. So may the Father and the Son and the Spirit bless you. May God keep you, bless you, turn his face toward you. And may the triune God give you grace and peace and lots and lots of joy. And all God's people say,